There we go. We love that. Okay. Great to have your attention this morning. Another beautiful Vermont morning. Now, a little damp, but uh, certainly cooler than most of the country, so that's okay. I can only imagine how much how hot I would be if I was in a hot part of the country. But Jackie says, you know, compared to Oklahoma, it's like early spring, so. Uh, this morning, uh, we're going to hear about the opposition, uh, and we have someone to talk to us who has literally done debate from all different directions. He has been a student debater, uh, he has been a high school coach, a college coach, he's done policy debate, uh, er uh, several different kinds of, of parliamentary debate, and also, if you're with him in the pub late at night, he can invent new debate formats <laughs> and ways uh, to disagree with you. Uh, while he was coaching at the University of Rochester, uh, he was part of a small group of coaches that led them to a national championship in policy debate. He's now come over to the dark side, and he's fully committed to the world's format uh, and fully committed in other ways as well. Uh, please, but, but please welcome, from St. John's University, the ever-entertaining Steve Young. Thank you, Tuna. Uh, the goal of this morning's session is to fit something that normally takes about two hours to do in about 30 or 40 minutes. So I'm going to go a little quickly, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't interrupt me if you have questions or you'd like to contribute. Uh, don't feel that whatever you're thinking, your question or your comment is unimportant. Raise your hand. It's fine. You can stop me. Sometimes I go a little off the, uh, the path you might predict. So feel free to ask and interrupt. Don't worry about that. Uh, but where we're going to start today is we're going to start with a question. And that question is, what is the goal of the opposition? And it's a question I send to you. What's the goal of being opposition? What are you supposed to do? Yes. Rich? To negate the resolution. To negate the resolution. What does that mean? No. You want to say no. You want to say no. Is that how we negate the resolution? We say no to it? You need to prove that there's no solvency for the value. Sp yeah, spoken like a very good from the policy ease there. You have to prove there's no solvency for the topic, for whatever the government is trying to prove. Very good. And what do you mean by solvency? Uh, that like whatever that the proposition doesn't solve for whatever value they've set up. Yeah. So whatever problem they've set up, they don't solve for it. That's another goal that we can have as opposition. It's not necessarily that you have to do both of those things, negate the resolution, negate the solvency of the problem, but those are both two different ways that you can win. What else? Someone else had their hand up over here. Or maybe I'm just wishful thinking. Yeah. Um, never mind. All right. Anyone else? What do you do as opposition? What do you think the point of it is? Prove there's a better way. Prove there's a better way, right? So is it possible to negate, to win the debate by proving there's a better way to fix the problems that the government's talking about? Maybe. You can, but you don't have to. You can, but you don't have to. What do you have to do as opposition? Prove the government wrong. Prove the government wrong. Is that what you, like, boiling it down, that's absolutely what you have to do. There he is. Prove the status quo is better than whatever change we're thinking right now. Okay, no, that's a new direction from the other things you said. Prove the status quo is better than any change that the government is offering. So. I think this is a good list and a good, you, you have the right sense about it. The thing is that uh, being opposition is pretty much boiled down to just a few basic things that you can do, that, but you don't have to do all of them. You can prove that the government team hasn't proven the motion. Right? You can say that they haven't given enough evidence to prove that this would be a good idea. And this is what we might call a defensive argument. Oh, okay, sure. Can you see me okay? No. Oh, yeah. Thank you. All right. Enough of that, you rude people. All right, so you can prove they haven't proven the motion. They haven't provided substantial evidence, significant enough evidence to prove that what they're doing is a good idea or that the motion would be a good idea. You can also say the motion's a bad idea. 
That's sort of a generic thing opposition can say. This motion is a bad idea. Regardless of the specifics, they're saying we're going to argue that this motion is a bad idea, but you wouldn't want to assent to this, whether it's a policy or whether it's a principle. Bad, right? We just wouldn't want to be involved. Support of the motion leads to undesirable effects. These can be policy effects, which is a causal argument, like a disadvantage, we might call it, where whatever they're going to do is going to have bad effects that they haven't predicted or thought about. Or if you're having a principle debate, a debate about ideas or a debate about or an analysis motion, as they would call it, uh, overseas in the UK, you would say that that idea, that principle they're holding, would lead to undesirable assent. We would have to agree with statements that we wouldn't want to by upholding that principle. Right. And finally, ever favorite, the model is flawed. The model has problems with it. We might agree that it's a problem. We might agree that the motion's a, a fairly OK idea. But whatever model they've presented is a bad one. You don't want to accept it. It's got problems. Right. So these are four approaches that you can take. And some of them um, gel with other ones, but you don't have to do all of them at once, right? You can choose. You can pick and choose what you want to do as opposition. Whether you're opening opposition or closing opposition, one can pick and choose. Right? So any questions about that? This is sort of the high theory point of the lecture before we get to the more specific stuff, but just the sense of what opposition's point is. Questions so far? OK, good. <laughs> so there are three major types of opposition argument. Three major types of opposition argument. Causal arguments. These are argument, arguments from causation. You are going to cause something nasty. Right? Or because of you, nastiness ensues. Right? Everyone dies. Planet explodes. I don't know. You wipe out all the butterflies. Whatever it might be is the bad result. Right? Workability arguments. You guys, this is your favorite kind of opposition argument from the debates I've seen, which is, uh, you know, the plan is going to be rolled back by fraud, or it's not really going to work. People aren't really going to like it as much as they should. Uh, it's going to be expensive. It's going to fall apart. This and that part's not going to work. These kind of arguments. So, like, sort of you attack the logistical nature of the model or the advocacy of the government. Right? Everybody clear on that? It's like, it's not going to work. There are problems with its functioning. And finally, counter models, which are a really rare sort of argument, but still worth covering, I think, because you will encounter them sometimes. It's good to know something about them, whether you choose to engage in them or not. People will do them. And some of you have naturally been trying to do this. Some of the uh, more beginning debaters in the practice debates I've seen, you've naturally tried to do this, which is an argument that sounds like, yeah, but there's so many better things to do than what they're doing to fix the problem. There's so many better things to do. Right? But those arguments can be frustrating because they don't really seem to work. Because what does government do? They stand up and they say, yeah, that's a great idea too, but it, we can do that and do our thing. You know? And you're like, oh, yeah, I guess so. But it'd be better to educate them than to pay them to lose weight. Yeah, OK, we can do both. Fine. And you're like, hmm, how does this work? So we'll talk a little bit more about that if you want to go into it. So. First is <laughs> causal arguments. Causal arguments. <coughs> Causation. <coughs> yes? I'm sorry, I need to know why the unicorns. Is there a small thing you can do? There are not. What are you, what are you, what are you talking about? What do you mean? <laughs> why did you put the top on the unicorn? Do they not do that here? <laughs> did you not get this in your class? <laughs> 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 hmm. <laughs> Maybe it's like a cultural difference between Vermont and New York City. <laughs> I don't know. Really? This isn't what your professors do? Yeah. They don't put unicorns in there? Hmm. Okay, well, you know, whatever. I just want to know what you Causal arguments. These are undesirable, unintended consequences of doing something. Either believing something, acting, whatever the government might do. Right? The important thing is that they are unintended consequences. That is, they don't mean to do it, right? Because don't get trapped into this thing of like, if you say, well, whatever your advocacy is, that plan of your advocacy is going to be, uh, it's going to create a lot of unemployment. 
right? A lot of government teams might say something like, oh, but that's not our point. That's not what we intended to do. We're actually intending to do really good stuff, and uh, that's not what we meant to do. Like, they might do that as a response. It's not a response to a causal argument, right? It's like, sure, you're trying to do something good, but here on the opposition, our point is that it's actually going to create more bad than good. You're actually going to create these problems that are undesirable. And this is where we get into what we would call comparative argumentation. Right? Causal arguments involve a lot of comparative argumentation, where you say this is better than that, that is better than this. So they might solve for, uh, they might be trying to solve for, let's say, the spread of AIDS in Africa. They're trying to reduce that a bit. Right? An unintended consequence or a causal argument against that would be that it might cause the, uh, the, the policy might cause instability in already unstable African governments, like all this Western aid or whatever they're trying to do, which might lead to a war between countries. There might be violence. So what you would have to do as a debater on the opposition is compare and say, e you know, even if they get some sense of solving back the spread of AIDS, it's actually worse to have the war. And you're going to have to figure out ways to make that comparative argument. That's one of the most important things you can do on the opposition is explain why something is worse. You can agree and say, look, government's ideas are good, and that's a good idea, and it actually will fix some of it. But unfortunately, it's going to create something undesir more, more undesirable than any of the good that they would get from their arguments. And so you really have to get into the details of it. You can't just say, it's unemployment, it's bad. It's war, it's bad. You have to get into the details and explain exactly why that particular war is bad and why we wouldn't want that particular war. Um, when you're doing an analysis motion, or when you're doing a principle debate, as I call it, there are certain ideas that you might not want to assent to. Like if they're saying the first and most important principle of the government is efficiency, and that's the principle we stand for, and that's why we want to do this motion or support the motion is because we value an efficient government, you can always argue against that and say efficiency is not the most desirable factor of government. Why is that? Let me throw it to you and see if you can come up with some arguments of why efficiency might not be the best principle of a good government. Efficiency is supposed to be the lowest amount of input and the largest amount of output, which means that something's going to get cut in the process, and you have to determine what they're going to be cutting. And if they just say they're going to be cutting this, though, and they're wanting this larger amount of output, it's not going to work because there has to be more that's going to be cut in order for that to increase. Okay, so something would be cut. Yeah? Um, well, with the inefficiency, you might Environmental effects, like using coal, is less desirable than using something that's clean or burning. Mm -hmm. and in addition, it might be exploitation of workers to get the efficiency that you need. You might have, you might be cutting costs, and in doing so, cutting their pay. Okay. Somebody else in. Uh, efficiency is always at the expense of socioeconomic equality because if you have efficiency, you have less fairness in a way. The maximum output spread out. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. More important than being efficient is being democratic or, or fair. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now, why is that? How do those things contradict? Can I have an efficient democracy? <laughs> no. Like drive through voting or something like that? Can we? <laughs> <laughs> Quick and easy? That's what I was going to say. It's usually the most efficient government is, is a one man rule. Yeah. Yeah, okay. The fewer people you have in the decision process, the quicker you're going to come to that decision. Yeah. The fewer people involved, the quicker the decision, right? So a dictatorship is the most efficient form of government. Right? Now, all the other things that were said, the things Jared said and Emily said, are also quite good. Like Emily's coming up sort of with a, uh, the unintended consequence that we would hurt something else that we value if we lifted efficiency to the top. We'd hurt our environmental protection, right? So we're an efficient. We would just do whatever we thought was best at the time and not have like a forward view, not have future view. Because efficiency is limited by time to the here and now. So we wouldn't think about environmental impacts that might happen in three or four generations. Right? We wouldn't, this sounds kind of like the status quo in a way. But it's the thing that we would ignore. Right? So that's another way of doing it that I think is quite good. Uh, comparing it and saying if we, if we put efficiency as the top value, look at all the other things we'd agree to. That means that if you support this value, you're agreeing that a dictatorship is a good thing. Because right, it's the most efficient thing. So obviously there's a problem. We wouldn't want to assent as a society or as a debater or as an individual to that kind of idea. So that shows there's a problem with the principle they're supporting. Right? So because of that problem, it leads to this bad effect. Right? You see how that works? Questions about that? 
Because it's kind of a, it's a fairly difficult concept. I mean, we argue like this all the time, right? Right? Well, I'm not going to support that because that means I would also have to support this. Or if we do that, it's going to cause this bad effect. So that's a, those are causal arguments. No questions? Okay. Here are the requirements for good causal arguments. First, they must link specifically the action of the government. And when I say link, what do I mean? You guys know this word, right? Connect. Connect. Yeah. Relate. Relate. It has to directly connect. So you want to think of it as like when you set up a bunch of dominoes to fall. It's the thing that taps the first one is the link. It sets off the chain of events. So the link is whatever the government team does, whatever they advocate, or whatever their model says, that is going to push all the events in motion. So you have to be very clear about how it's <coughs> going to happen. If you're vague about it, the government teams can always come up and respond to your argument and say, look, you know, this could happen to anybody. This is, we're not causing this, right? They say that we're going to increase spending, but actually we're moving spending around. So we don't increase spending at all. We're using what's already there. So we don't, we don't link to this. That's what they're going to say. So you need to make sure you explain it. Then you have to be unique to whatever the government's talking about. Right? You have to say, they in some unique way caused this problem because you shouldn't get in trouble for things that aren't your fault. Right? If it was going to happen, if it's going to happen anyway, maybe it's best if we don't consider it as part of the decision in who should win the debate. Right? So differentiating yourself like this is a good way also as far as the difference between opening and closing opposition, of uh, doing the careful analysis to really set yourself apart from the other side of the motion that you're on, is to explain specifically how uniquely the proposal from the government is going to cause these problems. Only this kind of action would cause it. That really makes the causal argument stick really nicely. Right? Instead of just generic sort of arguments like, well, anytime the government spends money, we go into deficit. I mean, what's the response to that? What would you say? Stop spending money. The, the argument would be, well, you know, you're spending money, you're going to cause us to go into deficit. Deficit's bad. Oh, we, already have deficit. we already have a huge deficit. How would this plan, I mean, this is just like a teardrop in the ocean, right? It's not significant. And it's not going to cause much of a difference to that big problem. We shouldn't be blamed and have to defend and be blamed for the deficit. Right? Does this make sense to everybody? Okay. And then finally, you have to have an impact worse than any possible solution that they could get. So you always have to make sure your impact is a lot worse than theirs. You can win your causal argument. You can be totally right that unemployment is bad and unemployment is what they'll cause and people will lose jobs. But they also save the entire biosphere of the planet. I think I can suffer a little bit of an unemployment. Oh, oh, sorry. A little bit. <laughs> He's like, get out of the way. <laughs> You're standing in between me and my learning. Um, I think I could take a little dip in the employment numbers to save the biosphere of the planet. Right? So just make sure it makes sense and you compare and show exactly why that would be something bad or worse than anything that they could get as far as uh, a benefit to their arguments. Okay, everybody good? <laughs> Workability arguments. You're very good at these, right? So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. But the most important thing about a workability argument you need to realize is it can't be vague. You can't just say, well, I mean, you could, you could make this argument against any policy, right? You could say, well, we all know politicians are corrupt, so they'll corrupt the plan and they'll take bribes. I mean, well, how does that help me want to see what you stand for in order to win the debate? How does that help you differentiate yourself as offering the best contribution to the debate? I mean, workability arguments are great in everything, and I think you need them. You need to point out because it shows the logic of the other side and how flawed it is, and it gives you a chance to shine to say, their analysis isn't so good. Look at the flaws of this. But it needs to be very specific, and you need to show the specificity of how whatever they're advocating is going to not work. And then it needs to be grouped with other arguments, and we'll talk about that in a second. You can't just win, you can't just set yourself apart, I think, as an opposition debater, just by saying their plan's a bad idea. Right? And the reason for this is just sort of a simple statistical analysis, right? All you're doing, I'm going to cut the light on here for a second so yep. I can use the board. All you're really doing, if you think about it, and this is why these kind of arguments are not so great, is after the government gives their argument, they have 
If you don't say anything, and you agree with everything they say, they have a 100% chance of doing what they say they're going to do and fix the problem, right? You agree with me? No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so if you argue your workability arguments, what's the most you could possibly hope for as far as taking out their percentage? Like you would want to take out 100%, right? But nothing is usually that great, right? Nothing is usually that solid as far as the percentage of taking it out. Generally, what you could hope for is a perfect system is you can reduce them down to about 1% chance as a reduction. They have a 1% chance of fixing any problem. Now, if you just do workability arguments, you show you it's not going to work, it's not going to work, it's not going to work, and bring them down to 1%, what's the re who, what side of, of, the, of the argument is the reasonable person going to come down on? Yeah? 1%. Why? Because you haven't pointed out any problems with this policy you didn't cause. So even if there's a one, only 1% 1 chance, why not just try? Yeah, why not just try, right? So they can easily, in the government whip, be saying stuff like, look, we have a lot of problems with it, but they haven't pointed out anything really bad about what we're doing. So why not try it? We still have a 1% chance that's better than doing nothing, because they're not saying we should do anything. They're not saying anything really bad should happen. Why not try it? We still have a 1% chance. Right? And that's the analysis that would happen. Right? It might not be very good for your side of your argument. So you can't just base your strategy on workability arguments. But workability arguments can really, really help you when you're having the debate of they're going to cause unemployment or conflict versus they save the biosphere, you can use the workability arguments to say, they don't save the biosphere. They maybe help stabilize a few square meters of Brazilian rainforest for two years, and they're going to cause this huge spike in unemployment. Now, that's a much more fair argument to have. Right? So workability arguments help you generate argumentative power behind your arguments that are going to help you win the debate or at least provide the best analysis, the best sort of arguments for your side. Right, or for your team. Right? Does that make sense to everybody? This is why workability arguments should not be your first line of defense. So when you're prepping a motion on the opposition, the workability stuff should really come in the debate. Right? As you hear the model, as you hear what they're saying, that's the kind of thing you're thinking about with your partner and putting it together in the debate. Right? The things you're thinking about when you're prepping are going to be the big reasons why we wouldn't want to do it, the big bad things that would occur no matter how we would do it or no matter how we would assent to this thing. Those big bad things, those are the things that are going to be your independent line that are going to help you win the debate. Workability is only one debate. Right. Okay, so now we get to a much more complicated argument countermodels. These arguments are really, really rare, and they're really sort of ill advised, I think, in Bill BP debate because of a lot of the attitudes of judges against them and also just the climate is one in which it would be better to have a strategy of causal arguments and a strategy of workability arguments. You can win probably 98% of the debates that you're in on opposition. With that strategy, you can set yourself apart, distinguish a clear line, and have the best contributions to the debate if you just think about those things. But sometimes a counter model is an argument that's necessary. And what a counter art model is, is not anything that you've ever heard of before. People say, a counter model is when you decide to become government. No, you can't decide to become government. If we did that, we would never have debate tournaments because no one would decide to be the opening government. Right? We would just have three teams ready to debate. And where you have four teams ready to debate, and two of them would want to be closing up, and <laughs> one of them would want to be closing gov, and one would be opening up, and then no one would want to be. That's why we assign the sides. So you don't transform. You don't become the government. Uh, another thing I've heard people talk about as far as counter models go is that you're offering another plan. You're offering a different model, a different plan. That's not also not what's going on. Right? The only thing that you're doing when you do this, when you say, uh, I think there's a better way of dealing with this, the only thing that you're doing is saying, look, you should reject the government's proposal. That's all you're doing. You're just doing it in a different way than the other arguments. A workability argument says you should reject the government's proposal because it doesn't work as well as it should. That's the weakest kind of opposition argument. The stronger opposition argument is you should reject the government's proposal because it leads to more bad than good. Right? I mean, this is the way you argue all the time. You decide what film you want to go see with your friends. Right? You're just like, well, you know, it's, we're going to be disappointed. It's going to suck. Da, 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 da. Right? It's a much stronger argument than, well, the special effects aren't as good as they could have been. That argument isn't a reason to reject going to the film. Right? But the argument that the film really sucks that it's awful, that everyone has panned it, and that we'll be disappointed and angry is probably a better argument. 
the counter model argument is the same sort of thing. It's if we go to the film, we won't have a chance to go out drinking, which would be better, which would solve the problems of our life better. <laughs> right? It would be much more entertaining. Right? That's the counter model argument. All it is is a reason to reject them. It's not another plan, it's not another advocacy or anything like that. What you're saying is you're saying, look, that problem is a bad problem, it deserves attention, but the way that you're giving the attention to it is going to be counterproductive and re remove the ability to do this better idea. Right? We foreclose the ability to do this other thing by doing your thing. And that's the economic argument of opportunity cost, which is behind every good counter model debate. Opportunity cost. Who can explain this concept to me? Yes? It's what you give up to achieve what you get. It's what you give up to achieve what you get. Any other definitions? Are we satisfied with that? Okay, I guess we're satisfied with that. Yeah? It's necessarily something that you give up. It's just something that you can't can do both things. You can't do both things. There's a forced choice. I can't do both things. I have an opportunity to do one thing or the other. So one of the ways we can argue is we can say we should not do this one opportunity because the other opportunity is so much better. Yes? Kids are great at that. Oh yeah? Give me an example. Um, when my kids want to watch a movie, they want to try to counter whatever I want to watch with something they want to watch and they'll give me a hundred different reasons why I should watch what they want to watch instead of what I want to watch. Mm -hmm. Or we go out to the restaurant, they want to eat something that I don't want them to eat. Yeah. They'll counter my with their justifications and their reasons as to why their, their idea is better than my idea. Right. So it's sort of a basic argumentative thing is, no, don't order that. If we order that, then we can't eat this and it's so much better. Right. Right. So it is, in a way, a disadvantage to the government. Right? That's what you really want to think of these things as. Don't think of them as another plan or a different plan or now we have two first governments or anything like that. This is just a causal argument. Because you do this, you can't do this good thing. You lose. Right? So it is based on agreement. Like Mike's example is kids, right? So we all agree that we should watch a movie. Mm -hmm. right? Because that's going to fix some hole in our lives. right? At least that's what the movie industry wants us to think. Is your life sucks. There's a big hole in your soul. Go to the movies. God bless Disney. Pour some saccharin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Pour some saccharin in your eyes, and for three or four hours, you'll forget how miserable your life is. Right? That's the movie industry's model of success. Right? So uh, it's agreement. We all agree that we should go see a movie, but the difference is which one is better. We have a debate about opportunity. They work pretty well with causal arguments as well. Right? So you could say the model that they give you hurts the economy. It creates some economic problems. Right? And they foreclose the opportunity to do this other thing. This other thing would not cause those economic problems works pretty well together. They all sort of mesh in a nice way. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. So it sort of is, a, is an added benefit or an added value to the idea that the thing could, uh, that the thing is not only a lost opportunity, but a lost opportunity that avoids disadvantages. Right. Is everybody with me? And then workability arguments are really essential for doing this. Like if you just do a counter model and you don't talk about any of the workability or any of the problems of what the model is, then you're going to lose. Right, you're going to lose. You have to point out the flaws because those are the things where the clash is going to happen in these debates. The clash is not, my plan is better than yours. Right? The plan is that's an undesirable model because of the effects of it. The effects are poor. Right? The effects are really bad. And this would be one of the effects of the plan that would make it really bad. Right? So is everybody with me? Does that make sense? Okay. Because you're going to encounter these things and, and if you're a government, and opposition talks about these things, you really want to make sure that there's an opportunity cost. The best way to take care of it is to say, there's really no opportunity cost here. There's no forced choice here. We can do all of these things. It's totally fine. Because right? it's not a reason to reject you. If it were true that the idea behind the counter model was that we just have two competing plans, then that argument wouldn't work as well as it does, right? Naturally. Right? Like, so when you guys say, we should do education instead of something else, the other team is like, yeah, education is important too, but we can also do this. I mean, that argument, it sort of like takes the wind out of the sails, right? It takes the clash away, right? So you want to make sure that it's sort of engaged, that they engage each other in this way. Okay. How to prep when you're opposition. How to prep when you're opposition. Motion analysis is much, much, much more important as opposition than it is proposition. 
That sounds counterintuitive, but here's why. When you're a government team, you only need to prep one thing, right, when you're opening government. Because guess what? You get to decide what the debate's about. So you only have to prep one thing. If you're closing government, you need to prep more things, but it's still pretty limited because you have a sense of where you'd like to go and what you'd like your line to be, right, as a closing government. But as opposition, you have no idea what they're going to say. Unless it's a really closed motion, you might have a sense, but you really don't know. So you need to do a much more analysis about what the motion is talking about. There are special terms in any motion that can give you the, the uh, energy to create your opposition line. These are terms that are related to time, manner, action, and geography. You can always find good causal arguments in these areas on any opposition. Right? Words that have to do with time are really important. Right? As soon as possible, immediately. Right? <laughs> Things like this can generate ideas. Like, what is the generic argument about why you shouldn't do something immediately? It's essential. No, why you shouldn't. Yeah. We're opposition. Awesome. Oh, come yeah. on. You haven't thought about it? You haven't thought about it. Very good. Now, that's the genesis of opposition argument right there. We haven't thought it through. Now, what's the problem? What's the impact if we don't think something through? Unforeseeable consequences. Unforeseeable consequences. Gloom and doom, right? Very nice. Right. So that's one of the words. Manner, the way it's done, right? And some of the key words for that I'll put on the board here because for some reason I didn't put them here. I don't know why. Ban, legalize, um, allow, uh, establish. These are all key words to look at because these will be the root of your generic, I mean the list goes on, right? The list goes on. But these are all key words that will establish your generic opposition positions that you can always make a line for you and your partner. What's the problem with banning something? It's not allowed. People want what they can't have. So what does that mean for society? Okay. You establish a black market. Why are black markets bad? Because it's not taxing. It's non tax That's not really the heart of the argument, though. It's like, oh, the problem with the mafia is the fact that we can't tax their, their business. That's not really the round-winning position, is it? What's the big argument about the black market? Organized crime. What's wrong with that? I like organized things. I'm not very organized. I'm jealous of things that are organized. I think organized crime is better than regular crime. This is outside the rest of the system. Come on, people. Okay, if Tylenol, let me just give you, let, you're, you're, I don't know what you're doing. You're either underanalyzing or overanalyzing or something. But if Tylenol and Advil have a dispute about marketing their drugs, do the executives from Advil go and air out the corporate headquarters of Tylenol with 9 millimeters and Uzis in a drive-by? Is that how they solve their problem? Okay, so what's the problem with the black market? Violent violence and intimidation. Yeah, there's absolutely no structure for them to solve their conflicts problems. They use violence to solve them, right? right? The CEO of Tylenol doesn't take his sod off over to Advil and start airing it out because <laughs> they've infringed on his market, his trademark, right? So think about the big argument. I, I mean, the thing about it is you have to think about the big argument because you're opposition. You're not going to win if you're just like, their idea isn't as good as it could have been. That doesn't, that, how can you get behind that? That's not exciting, right? Their idea isn't as good as it could have been. Vote for us, right? I mean, just think about that in a political campaign, right? What if John McCain, would, what if John McCain's strategy was something like, you know, that Obama guy, he's really not as great and as awesome as you think he is. McCain, 2008. Isn't no one would get is. behind that, right? Why are you trying to win debates like this? It's not going to work, right? You need to establish solid... Like, a black market's evil because they only have violence to solve their problems. They can't go to court to fix their conflicts. They have to shoot each other. And when we have gunplay on the streets, innocent people get killed. Crossfire incidents all the time in gang warfare because of the illegality of drugs in this country. Right? So, that would be the way. Any of these things, whatever the action is, whatever the way that action is done, um, can lead to bad effects. So a ban, that's always a stock argument you can have for that. What about when I legalize something? What are some of the generic bad things about legalizing something? Like, if we're going to legalize pot or something. What's wrong with the, even if we don't know it's pot, just the problem, we're going to take something that was illegal and we're going to make it legal. Usually the, um, uh, the demand for it decreases now that it uh, has a higher availability. And why is that a bad thing? You're justifying something you've already made clear as your policy is wrong. 
and why is that bad? Because it shows a double standard. It shows a double standard, and a double standard is bad because it hurts your credibility. Hurts your credibility. Hurts the ability of the government to maybe stand, say like, this is morally important for you not to do this, oh citizens. Right? The next time they do that, they might not be believed because we changed our minds on things. Right? So like, if we legalized it and it was illegal and it was a moral thing, now we have a double standard. People aren't going to listen to the government. That's bad because we might really need to use the government to, to make people do something in the future. Right? Now, these are independent opposition lines you can always make if you use your prep time well. Right? Prep time isn't just to bum a cigarette and to gossip about the person from the other school you used to date who might be at this tournament or not. Right? You have to, if you're opposition, it's not like, woohoo, party time. Right? You have to do harder work than you do in your government. Right? Geography, right? the places and the places that occur. This was a big one for the makeup topic, the banning of makeup in middle school. Very, very few debates, I think, really talked about the specificity or the importance of it being at the middle school. Right? We talked about makeup and the image of women and things like that and the age of the girls and all this, but the geographic entity could be the root of a lot of good disadvantages, right? a lot of good arguments against it that can, you can add to the debate and really get a good contribution. Right? Like we shouldn't do it at this particular place. If any of the other things fall apart, we shouldn't do it at this particular place. And don't forget a team line. Make sure you have a slogan, some kind of a statement or something of what we stand for, right? It can be as simple as, we in the closing opposition, we stand for this today. And we're going to show it to you through these two points of analysis. But this is what we stand for in the opposition. We believe that you should never endorse efficiency when dealing in politics. Because that would mean we would celebrate dictators and not Democrats. That's our line. Right, you want to think of it as kind of a slogan. It sets, it frames the debate, and it sets you apart from the other ones. It's like a nice, like at a wine tasting, they give you crackers, right? They're not doing it because crackers are healthy or they really want you to eat something. Like, well, you know, it's really out of balance. We're drinking a lot. We're not eating anything. No, it's not because of that at all. They want you to buy the wine, so they don't want you to confuse the flavor of their wine with the one you just tasted. So they want to clear the palate so you can see their wine from an objective point of view. Right? So that's what the frame, the team line does for you in opposition. Say, so here's what we stand for. Here's what you're endorsing. Right? And this way, you can avoid just having an opposition strategy of just workability arguments. Right? Because if you have that strategy, it's not really, uh, it's kind of hard to get behind you. Right? So this won't force you because you can't have a team line of like, we in the closing opposition believe that because the plan doesn't work as well as they said it would, that they're bad. Not exactly exciting debate moment there. Right? So. Okay, so there are three different types of motions, as we know. We know there's fact, val value, and uh, policy, or maybe we could just think of them as principle debates and policy debates, but then there are also different types of motions within that. Open motions, closed motions, and motions that are ajar or partially open. So open motions are incredibly broad. You have no idea what people are going to do. You have no idea what the government's going to say. The more open, the more generic the preparation. So it's OK to prepare for an open motion by just these generic senses of like, why is banning something, why is endorsing something generically bad? Right? The worst open motion I think I ever had was, this house is up with people. I had to debate that once, and I was opposition. So my partner was like, it's time to smoke an entire pack of cigarettes and stretch out, <laughs> st stress out. Right? This house is up with people, so we're like, OK, so how do we prep for this? <laughs> right? So the strategy is, well, if you're up with something, you're probably supporting it. Right? So why is support a bad idea? <laughs> that was basically where we had to start. Why is supporting something a bad idea? It sounds ridiculous, but I bet you can come up with a good, one good reason why supporting is a bad idea. Bad to support terrorists. Yeah. It, doesn't it depend on who you're supporting? Right? Support's not inherently a good thing. Right? Could be supporting terrorists. Creates dependency. Creates dependency, right? The people have they get they get codependent. They really need that affirmation to be able to do anything. If you're supporting this, why are you not supporting? Yeah, what's the opportunity cost, right? We support this, is are we foreclosing the support of something else? Very good. So that would lead us down the strategy to a counter model, right? False hope. False hope, right? We uh, foreclose the ability of a critical response. We give people a false hope. So this is the way you do it on an open motion. It's not, an open motion isn't a chance for you to just throw your hands up or weep uncontrollably or <laughs> whatever you might do, right? It's, um, it's a chance to really just kind of work hard to think of like why these things are bad because 
guess what? You know, the judges are like, geez, I'd hate to be opposition on this topic as the <laughs> chat, you know. And if you really shock them with something smart, clever, interesting, your ranking will go up, guaranteed, right? Because they're expecting to hear something kind of bad and predictable. And if you can be like, we on the opening opposition stand firmly against supporting things. <laughs> we think supporting things is bad. They'll be like, what? <laughs> They'll be like, point of interest, why should we support you? you know? <laughs> but it'll, but it, would, uh, it would lead to a funny debate, it would bring the debate, it would bring clash, and it would make the debate that would be weak, stronger, and you might be rewarded for that. You might be re re rewarded for that, okay? So I say if it's open, brainstorm at least three cases and find a major Carlsler argument that links to each case. So you and your partner brainstorm what you would do in government. Three different governments that you would do, very simple. Like here's the problem, here's the model, here's a big, okay, here's a causal problem with that. Then you'll have it, and then when you go into the debate, you won't be completely flat-footed. So, here's a sample motion. <laughs> now, I'm not going to tell you my personal feelings on this motion. Right? I'm not going to reveal my hand as to what I feel about it. But even if you had a strange motion like this, where do we start with the things I've given you? Where do you start to prepare for this? What's the first thing that you would do with your opposition? Doesn't matter if you're closing off or opening off. What would you start? With? What would you start? With? Yeah. They're distracting. They're distracting. Okay. So what kind of argument is that? How does that fit into the things that we've talked about? Um, you're not paying attention to the oh. lecturer. Yeah. Not paying attention to the lecturer. That's not true. No, I'm just kidding. Well, I don't require, <laughs> I feel like you're requiring one time. Require, okay, this is interesting. So the place we start, start is this idea of requiring, right? Because this will bring more nuanced arguments, right? We could argue that it's perfectly fine if lecturers want to include unicorns in their PowerPoints. But it's the problem comes, ladies and gentlemen, from the requirement of it. In all. In all, right? Now these are the key words. Remember those four sort of key words? These are words about action and manner, right? All and require. And this can generate a lot of good negative arguments against it. Now, your initial brainstorming is very good, right? They're distracting. But it has to be, if you just get up and you sort of say, okay, they're distracting, da 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 da, da without sort of framing it in a larger strategy, it can be problematic. Well, wouldn't that be like an undesirable effect for the Very good. The very good. Now, why is distracting bad? Isn't it good to be distracted during a lecture? I mean, no, because then you're not actually retaining the material that's being And why is that bad? because then you're not learning. So we actually decrease the learning. So what will we say about the government? They're actually counterproductive, right? They actually decrease the thing they're claiming they're going to increase. And why just PowerPoint? Why just PowerPoint? Now what kind of argument is that? Well, why stop there? Government will control. Yeah, but what kind of argument is this on opposition? What kind of argument is this? If you're to say, well, our opposition, the reason we think that these teams should be rejected is because they don't go far enough. Yeah. If it's, power, if it's PowerPoint now, why is it going to lead into? Yeah, I'm not interested in the, let me rephrase this, I'm not interested in the actual truth or functioning of the argument as far as the, the way the argument plays out. I'm interested in the theoretical level of what kind of argument is this. Workability. Workability. Yeah. How does this work, though? I mean, is that really a reason to reject them is they don't go far enough? They're not as good as they could be? I guess it is workability, isn't it? They're not as good as they could be? It also, couldn't also be a counter model because you're agreeing that, yeah, we should, we should have put it in, on, uh, during le lectures, but not... Uh, Okay, so how does the fact that if we, if we require it in PowerPoint, how does that foreclose the ability to include it in other types of teaching? How does that happen? Is there an opportunity cost here? You could argue that you were discriminating against uh, lecturers who used PowerPoint by requiring something of them and not of others. Very good. So we say we discriminate. And what kind of argument is this? We're discriminating against lecturers who don't use PowerPoint. And I support them. I, I'm not much of a PowerPoint guy. But... Um, I was talking to my wife, and she's like, you should put unicorns in your presentation. I said, okay, I'll do it for you. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> uh, she's probably not watching this video. So what kind of argument is that? Discriminates against those who don't use PowerPoint. Is that, how is that a reason why we should reject the, the model or we should reject the motion? Or discriminates against those who do use PowerPoint. Oh, discriminates against those who do use PowerPoint. Because they're the only ones that have the requirement. Right, okay, so why is that bad? What's bad about that? PowerPoint's the, the main presentation um, software that people <coughs> use now, or it's the main way that people present things now anyway, because it's so easy to use. Mm -hmm. Okay, so why is that? Give me an impact. Well, 
You, I need something tangible. You decrease the you decrease the amount of content that they can have in the PowerPoint. Oh, okay. Because this takes a lot of space. Right? I'll turn the lights off so we can have a much better teaching moment here. This takes up a huge amount of space where I could have put actual information that would be useful to you in learning how to debate instead of entertaining myself and my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Although, I guess, like, as, I mean, just like to count about it, like, that would say, it doesn't say that that has to be on every slide. It could just be like, uh, on the last slide, throw on a unicorn, think what we prepare. Okay, so the government could say this. So now that means we probably need to make our argument a little bit broader, like maybe on the level of principle or something. Why is it wrong to require teachers to do, to put certain material in their lectures? Let's do it in general like that. This is along the lines of discrimination against those who use the PowerPoint. Why is that a bad thing? Because you're accepting to a principle you don't want to discriminate. Okay, why would I not want to assent to that? Don't I discriminate every day? Like when I went to breakfast this morning, I discriminated between, you know, I didn't want oatmeal, I chose something else. Why is it bad? Isn't discrimination the thing that keeps us alive? I mean, I'm just asking. I'm not. I'm just trying to get you to think. I'm not saying you're wrong here. I just want you to think a little deeper. Well, a relatively relevant thing would be Microsoft. If you want to look at Microsoft in general or Windows, there was a lawsuit because they put Windows Explorer as the internet browser. They were forcing people who bought Windows, who used PowerPoint or whatever, to use Microsoft Explorer yeah. instead of other brands. Yeah. So that would be a relevant thing as to an example of, wait a second, we didn't allow them to force their product or their thing on everybody. So how can we, how can the government then turn around and force to use this on this product when the government had a problem with it to start with? Okay, so what we have here in that is there's an, exa there's an analogy from business. If in the business world it was deemed illegal to force people to use one web browser, therefore in the academic world it should be illegal to force people to use one type of Image, image or what type of that's an argument by analogy right? that's an argument by analogy very good sort of thing the point of all this is to get you to sort of think about the different ways you can do it. and this is kind of prep I mean how many minutes have we spent doing this right three four something like that we would still have ten or twelve left and if you do this with your partner you'll generate a huge amount of stuff that you could say which will make opposition pretty easy and you won't just have to rely on just a laundry list of what's wrong with their proposal which is a surefire way to I mean if you make a laundry list uh, what's wrong with the proposal? You're debating for third, you know, quite honestly. There's nothing, you're not advocating, you're not setting yourself apart from, you're not standing for something, you're debating for third, right? This is as high as you can go. As we go more general, less of a closed motion, more of an open one. How does the preparation from the last motion differ for preparation from this one? It's a value. It's a value, very good. What does that mean, though? You're right, but you can be as right as rain. It might not help you. Hey, I know it's a value motion. Well, what do you do now? Well, I don't know, but in my argumentation textbook it said, but, uh, so I'm right about that. Maybe we can just talk about that. Somebody's opinion. Okay, how is the last one not somebody's opinion? Well, this they're, say they're saying that images of unicorns improves something. Yeah. Which you don't like unicorns. Okay, so as opposition, we would have to argue what an improvement would be. Am I out of time? Uh, can I have three more minutes? Is that no? Time is not mine to give, but go ahead. Oh, okay. Yours. So <laughs> the difference here is improve, right? Now, Mike is saying this is an opinion, but I don't know if that helps us all that much because I think every motion is an opinion, right? I think the idea of improve is something that's an equivocal term. It's in the eye of the beholder, right? It might improve it for one person but not another, so we would have to talk about what improvement really means. And the fact that these images don't necessarily improve all of the time, right? That might be the line that we would take for opposition. So, I had a couple more, but I think we should probably move on to our fantastic debate. So let me use the last two minutes that we have for questions about being opposition, questions about things you've heard in the lecture, questions about problems that you've encountered, or anything that I've <coughs> talked about this morning. Yes, sir. So for the counter models, can you think like how there's kind of different? schools of thought on how a government should act and say they're mutually exclusive. So say uh, one wants to accept more capitalist models and come up there and be like, no, I think we should have more social welfare, more of a socialistic model. I think that those philosophical debates are exactly when you don't want to use a counter model. Okay. 
I think that those are principal debates. Mm -hmm. And I think you can get the exact same argumentative traction and power by saying something like, the problem with the government is they rely on capitalism, right? Our line is going to be that relying on capitalism is counterproductive. That's going to mean they're going to cause the exact problem they're trying to solve. So we're going to argue in our line how this policy fails because it's in the deeper mindset. Right? On the policy level, it might look good, but it's in a deeper mindset of a capitalist orientation, and that's bad. We wouldn't want to endorse it. Right? But you're going to have tr some trouble with that, I think, unless you really nail it down. Right? But I don't think a counter model is a, a very good idea, only in very rare cases. There's a couple of pretty good examples I've heard of debates where a counter model happened, and it sounded like a good idea, but there were only like maybe two I've heard of where I was like, okay, that makes sense. Because it's really just a unique way of saying there's a disadvantage to what they're doing. Yeah. A very unique sort of disadvantage. So if you can get it through arguing with causal arguments and workability arguments, I would say go that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's also an inherent bias against them in the community. Right? So. Okay. No, no, go, continue if you have follow-up. I know a lot of that you're talking about how uh, sort of the makeup debate could actually be you know, a question of whether or not we should enforce capitalism, you know, and growing up sort of in the real world, you know what I mean? That we're just being prepared for consumerism. Yeah. Life. Remember when we, were kids, we had that talk. Yeah, yeah. So should the opposition maybe get up and just say that we should reject capitalism without necessarily endorsing Sure, I think that's so certainly say reject possible. Capitalism rather than saying endorse socialism at the same time. I think it's perfectly possible, but again, the question of uniqueness comes into it. The government will stand and say, why should I have to defend the entire system of capitalism just to cause good for one small group of people who are suffering? Right? Why should I have to defend the entire system? Right? That's not what the debate's about, and they can certainly say that. So you need to think of a way to prove that they're uniquely endorsing a corrupt system. It doesn't have to be capitalism beginning. They're uniquely endorsing that corrupt system. That's a reason they should lose. Right? That's a reason why their idea isn't, isn't good. That's a reason why you should endorse the opposition. Mm -hmm. right. Sir? Right. Well, maybe, maybe the discrimination is going to get back. It's wrong, uh, it's, it's wrong because uh, you live in a society where uh, being, being fair and equal to each other is, is what's considered right. Okay, so being fair and equal to each other is what's right. We get a better society because of that, and discrimination interrupts those things. Yeah. All right. Isn't discrimination the thing that I use in order to determine who I should be fair to? No, they're supposed to be fair to everyone. Everyone, just regardless. Okay, mm -hmm. makes sense. What are you uh, going to say? Just a question, it's sort of about uh, opposition. Yeah. Uh, what is the rule with changing the motion to, like for instance, yesterday the government changed our motion from from a huge tax on luxury cars to a minimal luxury tax on a huge. Can you change it to anything you want? No. Well, <laughs> is my question. Big question. Uh, if first government takes the motion in a way that you don't want them to take it, tough. But what if they reorder words? Literally. Like, what if I change this to? There's not a lot you can lectures do. Lectures improve the quality of unicorn images. Well, uh, they've probably they've probably misread the motion. Right? You still should debate them on whatever they've advocated, as long as it's actually debatable. Right? As long as you can come up with some arguments against it, you should debate them. But you might want to say something like, "Well, I think the opening government has missed the debate here." Da 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 da. Right? And then argue against whatever they actually said. Right? You're never going to win a debate by saying they screwed up. We don't have anything to say. Feel sorry for us. Is there any reason why you wouldn't do that? Kind of just totally like. You wouldn't do it because you'll be punished for it. I mean, if oh, you yes, screw I mean. up the motion, if it says a huge luxury tax on cars and you decide to put a small user fee on paddle boats, you're going to get fourth. The judge is going to put you fourth. Okay. I mean, it's just. And the other teams, like, if you like, try to debate it and at least try to have a good debate, an interesting debate and stuff, then you're going to be ranked higher. It's like, well, yeah, this really sucks, but you're going to be ranked higher. But if you purposely misdefine the motion as a government, you are fourth. Okay. No question. Yeah, you think you're so smart yeah. by reinterpreting the motion completely, and you will end up being punished by the judge, and you'll be fourth. So you ain't so smart. And I mean, no one wants to debate this way except people who are like really hyper attorneys, right? Like, ooh, look at the technicalities. I can go in and I can really do it. Nobody wants this. is not interesting or exciting, right? It's like, it's tax law. I mean, we don't debate that. It's not interesting. Sorry, tax attorneys, but I really think <laughs> Last question. Yep. I, on a related line, if you're, if you're trying to interpret the resolution and 
uh, you're talking about these arguments against ban, and that's yeah. a generic argument against ban. Isn't that kind of an unfair argument to, to say you're upholding the resolution and that's a bad thing? Because it, well, we can't help it if the resolution says we have to ban. If you know, you cases have to, like those, can you reinterpret that word ban into something? Well, this is just for so stark and sure. Yeah, I, I think this is to help you generate arguments and lines of ways to go. Right. Now, first government is probably not going to come up and just be like, we're just going to straight up ban it. They might, right? You want to be prepared for that, but they might be clever and try to think of a way of doing it differently. Right. Whatever you've prepped for, why ban is a bad idea, you have to modify and nuance to fit whatever first government's doing. Really but I think it's perfectly fair. I think that the thing about debate is defending things that you don't necessarily, you wouldn't necessarily defend on your own. Right. To help explore them and to figure them out better. I guess so, what I'm really, really my question boils down to is how much latitude do you have? If, that, if the word ban appears in the resolution, how much latitude do you have to modify? Well, I think good debaters, good teams are just going to say we should ban it, which means get rid of it. And let's have the debate. Let's go for it. Bad teams are going to say ban means actually increase the amount that you are able to use on Saturday or something. Right. That's a really bad interpretation, and it's going to lead to a bad debate. I mean, what you think, if you think limiting the terms is going to lead to a good debate because they'll have nothing to say against it, that actually creates a bad debate. A bad debate is one in which no one has anything to say. It's silence. That's a bad debate right. because it's not one. It's staring contest or something. Silence, I don't know, whatever, the quiet game, something like that. So the latitude, the first government is going to take it however they want, but you'll be rewarded as opposition if you're like, look, we think the bans are a pretty bad idea. This is a ban. Here's why. If that's the line, if you think that's the best argument, I say go for it. All right. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Have a good debate. What's the stop recording button? Right, because we don't have as much time the red button.